Let's seek the Lord in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is once again to be here in your house, seeking to hear your voice speaking through the ministry of the Word. We ask, Father, that the same Spirit that inspired your Holy Word will come to explain it to us in this meeting. We realize that human wisdom is insufficient to understand the great things of your word, and therefore we plead for your help. And we thank you because you have promised that you hear our prayers and you answer them, because we ask it in the precious and powerful name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Amen. The title of our study today is Life and Death in the sanctuary. And I'd like to begin by reading a couple of verses that we find in Genesis chapter 1 and verses 26 and 27. This passage is very well known, undoubtedly, by all of us. It's speaking about the creation of our first parents, Adam and Eve. It says there in Genesis 1 verse 26, Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In these verses, we find, as I mentioned before, the creation of Adam and Eve in a perfect world. The Bible tells us that they were created in God's image and likeness. At this time, there was no sin in the world, and therefore, there was also no death. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that it was God's plan that Adam and Eve and the human race live forever. It was never God's plan that anyone on this planet should die. God's plan meant that man should reflect his image and likeness and live forever. But man was not going to live forever because he had some type of immortal soul. The Bible makes it very, very clear that there was a secret to the perpetuation of man's life. You see, God placed in the Garden of Eden a certain tree. It's called the tree of life. Let's read about that tree in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. It says there, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And now notice, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll come to that second tree in a few moments. But you notice it says here, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that in order for Adam and Eve to continue living, they had to continue eating from the tree of life. In other words, they did not have some immortal soul inside that would cause them to live forever. Their source of life was not inside. Their source of life was outside in a tree. I want you to imagine the tree of life kind of like a battery charger. And Adam and Eve would have to come on a regular basis, probably monthly, and I'll mention in a minute why. They would have to come and they would have to partake of the tree of life. In this way, their battery would be charged. You say, how do you say every month? Well, simply because in Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2, when everything is restored, we're told that the tree of life produces its fruit every month. And so the Bible seems to indicate that on a monthly basis, Adam and Eve had to go to the tree of life to partake of this source of life to recharge their batteries or to recharge their energy. 
I'd like to read a couple of statements, both written by Ellen White, where she makes some remarks about the tree of life. In the book Healthful Living, page 45, we find this significant statement. The tree of life possessed the power to perpetuate life. And we know that because God had to cast Adam and Eve out of the garden so that they would not continue eating of the tree and live forever. So the tree had virtue. It had life-giving virtue. And so it says the tree of life possessed the power to perpetuate life. And as long as they, that is Adam and Eve, ate of it, they could not die. The lives of the antediluvians, that is those who lived before the flood, were protracted because of the life-giving power of this tree, which was transmitted to them from Adam and Eve. And the Bible tells us that the people who lived before the flood, some of them lived to be, uh, be 930, 962, 969 years old because they had a human body that was closest to the energy that Adam and Eve had received from the hands of the Creator. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 60, we find another significant statement. Patriarchs and Prophets is one of my favorite books. It gives the history of Scripture from the fall of Lucifer in heaven all the way to the time of the Hebrew monarchy. And this is what uh, this statement says. In order to possess an endless existence, man must continue to partake of the tree of life. Deprived of this, his vitality would gradually diminish until life should become extinct. So the source of life for man was not inside. The source of life for man was outside in God's tree. Man did not have some immortal soul that would cause him to continue living forever. The Bible tells us that in order to continue living forever, man had to continue eating from the tree of life. Now, there was another tree that we read about in the garden, and that tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's read Genesis chapter 2 and verses 15 through 17. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 15 through 17. It says here, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. In Hebrew it says you will die by death. I don't know of any other way of dying, but God is saying you will really die if you eat from this tree. Now, why did God place this tree in the Garden of Eden? Simply so that he could give man freedom of choice. You see, if God had not placed this tree in the garden, man would have had only one choice, and that is to serve God. But the fact that God put this tree in the garden shows that God was giving man the potential of either following what God had said, but he was also giving him the potential to say no to God and to make a choice contrary to God. In other words, the tree of knowledge of good and evil clearly shows that God gave man freedom of choice. Now, it's very important to realize that God laid down the ground rules. God was the source of ethical decisions. God was the one who said, to not eat from the tree is good, and to eat from the tree is evil. He didn't tell man, you know, just choose whatever tree you don't want to eat from, and that's fine by me. God established the rule for ethical decisions. Now, there's something very, very important that we find in this one command that God gave Adam and Eve to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Actually, in this one command were contained all of the principles of the Ten Commandments. Now, let's read in the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 10. James, chapter 2 and verse 10. And I want, you to show, I want to show you a very important principle that we find in Scripture. 
And I believe that Emmanuel Beck read this text in our recent evangelistic series. It says there in James chapter 2 and verse 10, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of what? He is guilty of all. So in other words, in this one command were actually contained all of the principles of the Ten Commandments. And when Eve decided to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she was actually disobeying all of the principles of God's Ten Commandments. Let me give you some examples so that you can understand what I mean. When Eve decided to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was she thinking of making herself God? Yes, because the serpent said to her, you shall be like what? Like God. Was she violating the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me? Absolutely. What about the third commandment that speaks about taking the name of the Lord God in vain? Was she taking the name of the Lord God in vain? In fact, she was, because she actually in the statement that she speaks back to the serpent, she says, God has told us not to eat from the tree or to even touch it. God had not said that they couldn't touch the tree. God had said that they could not what? They could not eat from the tree. She was actually attributing words to God that God had not spoken. Let me ask you, did Eve dishonor her creator? Absolutely. There you have the principle of the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment brings attention to the Creator. Did Eve, by her sin, bring death into the world? Absolutely, because the wages of sin is death. Let me ask you, did she steal when she ate from the tree? Yes, because the fruit did not belong to her. Did she covet? Yes, the word is actually used there. She coveted the fruit because she thought that she could become wise. By the way, she also committed spiritual adultery because the Bible compares our relationship with God with marriage. What happens when we choose another person as our partner other than God? That is called what? Adultery. So she was violating the seventh commandment by choosing another lover, so to speak, who was Satan in this case. So in other words, in this one command, we're actually encased all of the principles of the Ten Commandments. By obeying this one command, Adam and Eve would be obeying all of the commandments of God. Now, it's a very important principle that we need to remember as we examine this story. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. We read this in our presentation this morning, and we want to read it again, and I'm sure that we will read it several times during this seminar. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. It says there, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. The King James Version says sin is the transgression of the law. So let me ask you, was there a law originally in the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve to break? Absolutely, because sin is transgression of the law. Adam and Eve could not have sinned unless the law was there. Now I want you to notice also that Romans 6 verse 23, the first part of the verse of Romans 6 23, says... For the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. So I want you to notice the sequence. Did God have a command that contained all of the principles of the Ten Commandments that he gave to Adam and Eve? Absolutely. Did he expect Adam and Eve to obey his commandment? Absolutely. When Adam and Eve chose to disobey God's commandment, what was that? That was Sin, which is transgression of the law. And when they sinned, the Bible says that the wages of sin is what? Death. There could be no death unless there was sin. And there could be no sin unless there was what? Unless there was the law of God. So in other words, in this one command were contained all of the principles of God's holy law. Now we need to take a, a look at the original temptation of Adam and Eve because it mirrors what happened in heaven when Lucifer decided to sin against God. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 
And we're going to study in detail the, verse, the first six verses of Genesis chapter 3. Now let me say that the devil is a master psychologist. The devil is an expert at playing mind games. In other words, he can take error and make it appear just like the truth. He can play tricks on your mind. The only protection that Adam and Eve had was simply to obey God's command. As long as they obeyed God's command, they were safe. But when they started dialoguing with Satan, Satan began playing mind games with Eve, and whoever plays mind games with Satan eventually ends up losing. Now notice, notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. What I want you to notice here is that Satan is trying to engage Eve in conversation. So what he's going to do is he's going to misstate something that God said. He's going to misquote God because he knows that Eve's immediate, rea immediate reaction will be to correct him and say, no, that's not exactly what God said. You know, when somebody tells you something that's wrong, what do you want to do? You say, oh, no, 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 that's not right, and then you correct them. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Is the devil misstating what God had said? Absolutely. God had said, Don't eat from this one. He didn't say that they couldn't eat from any tree of the garden. What is the devil trying to do here? He's trying to engage Eve in conversation. He knows that the reaction of Eve will be, say, will, will be to say, no, no, now wait a minute, that's not exactly what God said. Is that exactly what happens in the story? Absolutely. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verses 2 and 3. Eve is now going to correct the misstatement. It says in uh, verse 2, and the woman said to the serpent, now she says, you got it, uh, you don't have it exactly right. We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But now she's going to add something that the devil didn't bring up. She's going to add the consequences that God said were going to come if they ate from the tree. Notice what she continues saying in verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So what is Eve doing? First of all, she's correcting the misstatement by Satan. And then secondly, she's adding an explanation of what God said would be the consequence of them eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She said, God told us that if we ate from this tree, we would surely, what? We would surely die. Now the devil has her where, exactly where he wants her. Notice the first lie that he utters here, the first blatant open lie in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. What is the serpent saying to the woman? You are immortal. That's what he's saying. You will not surely die. Now, I want you to notice that at this point, Eve is suffering what is called cognitive dissonance. Now, let me explain what that means. It simply means that God said one thing, and the serpent said something that is totally opposite. So she's off balance. She's saying, now who could be right? Is God right, or is the serpent right? In other words, Satan is planting a question in Eve's mind based on what he said. When he says, you will not surely die, he knows that the next thought of Eve would be, then if we're not going to die, why did God say we were going to die? Are you with me? Is the devil playing mind games here? He most certainly is. You cannot argue with the devil. You can't reason with the devil. He'll beat you every time. 
What Eve should have said is, yeah, you know, you appear to, to be right in what you're saying. It makes sense. It's logical. But we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We simply obey what God said. We obey God's word. That was their only safety. Now, I want you to notice that the devil planted a thought in the mind of Eve, a question. And that is, well, God said that we were going to die. The serpent says that we're not going to die. Well, if we're not going to die, what ulterior motive would God have for telling us that we were going to die? Let me ask you, did the devil have an answer to the question that he planted in Eve's mind? He, see, this is all a mind game. The devil is playing games with, with her reasoning powers. And when she tries to listen to the reasons of the devil, she's lost. She should have fled from the tree. Now, I want you to notice what the devil has to say to her in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. The devil is saying, ha, so you want to know why God told you you were going to die if you're not going to really die, right? You want to know that, huh, Eve? And Eve says, yeah, tell me about it. In verse 5, the devil tells about it. For God knows. Ah, the devil is saying, God knows something that he doesn't want you to know. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your what? Your eyes will be open. What is he saying? God wants you to be what? He wants you to be blind. There's some valuable information that God is hiding from you. He wants you to be blind. He wants blind service. He wants blind submission simply because he says so. So it says, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And what is the next phrase? And you will be like God. We studied this this morning, right? What did Lucifer say in heaven? I will be like the Most High. Now he says to Eve, you will be like what? You will be like God. But now I want you to notice something very important. The devil is not saying that she's going to be like God in every sense of the word. He's saying that Eve is going to be like God in a certain restricted sense. In what sense? Let's finish reading the verse. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, what? Knowing good and evil. Let me ask you, who is the source of what is right and what is wrong? Who establishes the standard of what is right and what is wrong? God does, outside of us. God had said, don't eat from the tree, because if you eat from the tree, that's evil. Good means not eating. Evil means eating from the tree. God laid down the rule. And of course, in that rule were contained all of the principles of the Ten Commandments. Now, I want you to notice then that the source of ethical decisions is not within Eve. It is outside of Eve. But what is the devil telling Eve? He's saying, listen, you can be like God knowing what is good and what is evil without having to depend on God to tell you what is good and what is evil. Do you know that this is the first postmodern individual in the history of the world? The ideas of the emerging church go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The idea that you can be like God in the sense that you can decide what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong without recurring to God's objective law and His Word, but rather your own heart will tell you what is right and what is wrong. Is that the same thing that Lucifer argued in heaven to the angels? Remember for that statement that I read from Great Controversy 499 this morning? He said that the angels needed no law, that their own heart could show them what was right and what was wrong. He's saying the same thing to Eve. He's saying, you can be immortal if you eat from this tree, and you can be the own source of your ethical decisions. You don't have to depend on God telling you this is good and this is evil. No, you can decide that for yourself. You don't have to render blind service to God. You can be the source of your own ethical decisions. 
In fact, the devil is insinuating something even greater than this. And you have to kind of read between the lines to see it. But what Satan is really saying is, Eve, sometime in the past, I ate from this tree, and when I ate from this tree, or rather, sometime in the past, God ate from this tree. And when God ate from this tree, he got these marvelous powers of immortality and this marvelous power to distinguish between good and evil. But after God ate from the tree, he didn't want anybody else to have this capacity. And so what he did after this was intimidate everyone and tell them, hey, don't eat from the tree because you're going to die. But God actually knew in his heart, according to Satan, that if other people ate, he would have rivals around because they would have the same powers that he has. Are you understanding what the devil is saying here? It is an almost overmastering delusion that we have here. Of course, the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve ate from the tree. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. It says here, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, I want you to notice how her senses are involved. When she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. Let me ask you, wise in what sense? Desirable to make one wise. What did the devil say? Wise in what sense? In deciding what is good and evil for yourself. To make one wise, it says, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Are you understanding what's going on here? And so now Adam and Eve, have sinned. They have lost, so to speak, their spiritual robe of righteousness. And because they have lost their spiritual robe of righteousness, something happens to them now. Notice, this, notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. Here we find the first consequence of Adam and Eve's sin. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. You see, before this, they were covered with a robe of light. No artificial garments. But now the robe of light disappeared. They lost their robe of spiritual righteousness first, and as a result, they lost their literal robe of light. And so it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. How did Adam and Eve try to solve the problem of their nakedness? They made themselves coverings made out of what? Fig leaves. Now, what do the fig leaf garments represent? The context tells us that they represent the excuses that Adam and Eve offered for their sin. Now let's notice Genesis chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13. Genesis chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13. God comes and he says to Adam, what have you done? Notice the answer. Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. What is she trying to do? What is he trying to do? He's trying to pass the buck. He's offering excuses for his sin. And then God comes to Eve in verse 13. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. You see, the fig leaves are the excuses that Adam and Eve offer for their sin. They're trying to justify their sin. But you know what's interesting? Even after... They have covered themselves with the fig leaves. God comes in the garden and he searches for them. He says, Adam, where are you? Eve, where are you? And the man, they're covered with the fig leaves at this time. Uh, the man says, oh, we hid in the midst of the trees of the garden because we were naked. What nakedness are we talking about here? It's not only physical nakedness. The physical nakedness came as a result of losing their spiritual robe of righteousness. And do you know what else? Because they lost their spiritual robe of righteousness, they lost their physical robe of light, which had covered them, and ultimately they were going to suffer the ultimate nakedness, which the Apostle Paul calls death. 
If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul compares death with nakedness. That is the ultimate nakedness. But there's a sequence. You have, first of all, spiritual nakedness, sin. And then you have physical nakedness, the robe of light leaves. And then the consequence of that is ultimate nakedness, which is death. And so Adam and Eve are standing in the garden. They're shaking. They're saying, God gave his law. We've, had, we've transgressed his law. We've committed sin. And the wages of sin is death. We lost our spiritual robe of righteousness. We've lost our physical robe of light. And now the only thing that awaits us is physical, ultimate nakedness, which is death. And when they're shaking... God makes this beautiful gospel promise in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. My favorite verse in the whole Bible. In fact, I did a series of 52 one-hour lectures, primarily on Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, and how this verse is developed throughout the whole scripture. It says there in Genesis 3, 15, and God is speaking here to the serpent who has deceived Eve and has used Eve to lead Adam into sin. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. See, this is a woman who's going to have a seed or a descendant. And then notice the end result. He shall bruise, or as other versions say, he shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. Do you know what God is saying? God is saying, I'm going to send a seed to this world born of a woman. And that seed of the woman is going to do battle with you. In the process of the battle, the seed of the woman is, is going to be wounded by you. You are going to cause him pain on his heel. But when you have hurt his heel, his foot is going to come down and he is going to crush your head. This is the first gospel promise of Scripture. It's the promise of the coming of the Messiah, born of a woman, according to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. When Adam and Eve are shaking in, in their bare feet, because they probably didn't have anything on their feet, when they're shaking, thinking that they're going to die, they're going to suffer the ultimate nakedness, God, in their hearing, challenges the serpent and says, I am going to send a seed that will crush the head of the serpent who has led you into sin. I want you to notice this, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, after giving this beautiful promise, God says to Adam and Eve, because you lost your spiritual robe of righteousness and because you lost your physical robe of light, you are going to suffer ultimate death, ultimate nakedness. Notice Genesis 3 and verse 19. God is speaking to Adam and he says, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are and to dust you shall what? You shall return. Well, that sounds pretty final. Dust you are and to dust you shall return. Well, you see, we need to read two verses farther down where God offers Adam and Eve hope. Did you notice that in Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17, we're told that the very day that Adam and Eve ate from the tree, they would suffer ultimate nakedness? Spiritual nakedness would lead to physical nakedness, would lead to ultimate nakedness. God said, the very day that you eat of the tree, you will surely die. But Adam and Eve did not die that very day. We're talking about the final death from which there is no resurrection. The question is, why did they not die that day? Go with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Here's where the sanctuary comes in. You see, on the very day that Adam and Eve sinned, there was a sacrifice made to cover the shame of their nakedness. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. And for Adam, notice this is being done for them. And for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made, who made? He made them for Adam and Eve. Says the Lord God made tunics of polyester. 
No, that's not what it says. Tunics of cotton. No. Uh, tunics of linen. No, it says tunics of what? Of skin. And he clothed them. Who made the tunics? God did. Who clothed them? God did. He made it for Adam and Eve. Who is doing this? God is doing it. Let me ask you, what do you need in order to get the skin of an animal? The animal has to be killed. You see, there was a death the very day that Adam and Eve sinned. A lamb was sacrificed. And with the skins of the lamb, the shame of their nakedness was covered. Allow me to read you a beautiful statement that is found in Bible Echo, which is a, a magazine that was published May 21, 1900. This was written by Ellen White. Profound insight into what happened that day. She says, the instant Adam yielded to Satan's temptation and did the very thing which God had said he should not do, Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, saying, let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. Give him another trial. Transgression placed the whole world under the death sentence, but in heaven there was heard a voice saying, I have found a ransom. Isn't that a beautiful statement? By the way, it's sustained by the Bible because 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 20 tells us that Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world as a lamb. Revelation 13, verse 8 says that he was slain from the foundation of the world. Not physically, but he was slain in promise. There was a promise of the coming Messiah. In other words, the very day that Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus said, I will take upon myself their death penalty. I will die in their place. I will live the life that they should live. And a ransom that very day was found. This whole ceremony pointed to Jesus Christ. Now listen up. If man was immortal by nature, what, why would Jesus have to come to die to give him life if he already had immortality? You see what the idea of the immortality of the soul does? It makes Jesus Christ unnecessary. Because we have life because Jesus died. Not because we have some immortal soul within ourselves. So in other words, by teaching that man is immortal, what you're doing is depreciating the importance of the death of Jesus to give us life. If we already have immortal life, why would Jesus have to die to give us what we already possess or what we already have? Now let's go to the fulfillment of this. John chapter 19 and verses 23 and 24. You remember that spiritual nakedness led to physical nakedness, led to ultimate nakedness. That's what Adam and Eve deserved. Now, how could they escape the death sentence? Only by the death of the Lamb to cover the shame of their nakedness. Now, notice John 19, 23 and 24. I'm going to share with you something that might not be uh, very palatable to you, but it's biblical. You know, when artists depict Jesus on the cross, they usually cover him with a loincloth. But Scripture teaches that Jesus hung between heaven and earth totally naked. Let's read John 19 and verses 23 and 24. There's a very profound symbolism here. It says there in John 19, verse 23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts. This, these are his inner garments. And it says, and made four parts to each soldier a part. And also the tunic. See, he also had a tunic, which was a beautiful uh, robe that he wore outside his inner garments. And it says, now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among themselves. But then notice, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. They took his inner garments and his tunic away, and Jesus hung between heaven and earth, stark naked. Now you see, you say, what is the symbolism here? 
Let me ask you, did the father look upon Jesus as being guilty? He did, absolutely. Did Jesus take upon himself our spiritual nakedness of sin? He most certainly did. The Bible says that he took upon himself the curse. He who knew no sin was made sin to be for us. In other words, Jesus took our spiritual nakedness and therefore on the cross he hung what? Physically naked. And what did he suffer? He suffered ultimate what? Nakedness for Adam and Eve and all of their descendants. That's what Genesis 3 verse 21 pointed to. The death of the Lamb to cover the shame of our nakedness. Now the question is, when is the shame of our nakedness covered? Go with me to Galatians chapter 3, and let's read verse 27. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. A very important verse that tells us when we are covered with the spiritual robe of Christ's righteousness, the righteousness that he developed when he took our sin upon himself. It says in Galatians 3, verse 27, For as many of you as were what? Baptized, and what's the next uh, word, the next preposition? Into Christ have what? Have put on Christ. That expression put on is used in the New Testament to speak about putting on a garment, putting on a robe. So let me ask you, at what moment do we put on the robe of Christ's righteousness that he died to purchase for us? We put it on at the moment of baptism. And you say, Pastor Bohr, why at the moment of baptism? It's very simple. In our baptism, what we do is in miniature, we experience what Jesus experienced on earth. Jesus died. You agree with that? Jesus was buried, correct? And Jesus resurrected. Who did he do this for? He did this for us. He died for us, he was buried for us, and he resurrected for us. Now the question is, how am I included in what Christ did? How am I incorporated into Christ? That's the preposition that's used. How am I incorporated into the work of Christ? It's very simple. I go through the same experience that he did symbolically in baptism. Were you here this morning to see the baptism? Did you notice that the pastor is in the baptistry? And he has the candidate who is going to be baptized. And he says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What is that person doing before they go into the water? Well, they're breathing, but right before they go into the water, what happens? They stop breathing. Do you stop breathing when you die? Most certainly. And then the pastor puts them under the water. Do they breathe under the water? They better not. See, under the water, they're not breathing. Does a person who is under the earth, buried, breathe? No. What happens? What's the first thing that the person does when they come forth from the water? They, they breathe new life. They breathe again, just like when Jesus resurrected. So in other words, when we are baptized, we are being incorporated into the experience of Christ. We are included in Him. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Baptism is a phenomenal service. Some people think it's optional, you know, if you want to be baptized, fine. If you don't want to be baptized, that's all right. The baptism is the official incorporation into what Christ did. At that moment, what Christ did becomes yours because by faith, you're included in Him because you're participating symbolically in His experience. So when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're clothed with his spiritual robe. You have put on Jesus Christ. You are in him. Now this is important. Some people ask me the question, Pastor Bohr, are you afraid of dying? And I can honestly say I'm not. In fact, some people say, Pastor Bohr, aren't you afraid when you get in airplanes so frequently that the airplane is going to fall? And by the way, last year, I flew, I flew 200,000 miles. That's a lot of flights. I got on a plane 115 times last year, all of the segments. People say, aren't you afraid that the plane is going to fall from the sky? And I say, absolutely not. Because I believe that 
if my usefulness in this earth has come to an end, I'm fine with it. If God still has a plan, the angels are going to grab the wings, and they're not going to let that airplane fall from the sky. You say, how can you have that assurance? Why aren't you afraid of dying? Do you know why? Because I'm in Christ. Because I'm, when I was baptized, when I received Jesus as my Savior, I'm in Him. And Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus resurrected. He took my penalty upon Himself. When I go through ex that experience, He takes His righteousness and He covers me with His righteousness. I am no longer in me, I am in Him. Is that good news? That is pointed to in Genesis 3.21, where the lamb is sacrificed and the shame of the nakedness is what? Is covered. So let me ask you, where is our source of life? Inside in some immortal soul or outside in Jesus Christ? Our source of life, folks, is outside in Jesus Christ, not within ourselves. Now let me read you that great resurrection passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 15 and 16. And there's a little expression here that I want us to notice. It's speaking about those who die and the resurrection that will take place when Jesus comes. It says here, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and now listen carefully, and the dead, excuse me, I didn't hear you, the dead in Christ will rise first. When did we get into Christ? Or when did we get in Christ? When we received Him as our Savior and were baptized. We are in Him. So must we fear death? No, because here it says that the dead in Christ will what? will rise first. God's people will rise, those who are in Jesus Christ. Our hope of life is not in us. Our hope of life is in Him. We have no immortality within ourselves. The immortality is in Jesus. Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. And the sanctuary clearly shows by the sacrifices of millions of animals that the wages of sin is death. And the only way that sin could be forgiven is when it's taken into the sanctuary, into the presence of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. His name be honored and glorified. And then after God gave in Genesis 3.21 this promise of clothing the nakedness of man through the death of the Lamb, God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden. Let's read about it in Genesis chapter 3, 22, and 22 through 24. The garden is like the most holy place. And then they would come to the entrance of the garden and they would offer their sacrifices there. You say, how do you know that? Because at the entrance of the garden of Eden, you have cherubim. That's God's dwelling place. Man was cast out. Someday we will be able to go back in again through Jesus Christ. Genesis 3, 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live what? Forever. Did man have to eat from the tree to live forever? Of course. Then he, ha he did not have an immortal soul if he had to continue eating from the tree. Verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east. Where was the entrance to the sanctuary? On the east. It says, so he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Where was the source of life for man? It was in the tree of life. And what did the tree of life represent? It represented life outside of us in Jesus Christ. So the Bible says that there's no such thing as an immortal sinner. In fact, let's notice what the Bible has to say about immortality. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16 tells us who is the only one who is immortal. There we find these words, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate 
the King of kings and Lord of lords, and now notice, who alone has immortality. Now, let me ask you, what part of alone don't you understand? Other versions say who only has immortality. So who is the only one who has immortality? The King of kings and Lord of lords. And then it goes on to say, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Scripture also tells us in Romans chapter 2, verses 6 and, 6 and 7, that we must seek immortality. If we have to seek it, it's because we don't have it, because you don't seek for what you have. Notice what we find there in Romans chapter 2 and verses 6 and 7. Who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good, they what? Seek for our glory, honor, and immortality. What must we do with regards to immortality? We must what? Seek it. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. The Bible is clear on this point. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. Immortality has only been brought to light through the gospel. It says there in 2 Timothy 1 verse 10, but, and it's speaking about the plan of salvation, has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death. When it says he has abolished death, it's not talking about physical death because believers in Christ still die. It's talking about ultimate nakedness, ultimate death. death. So it says, who has abolished death and has brought what? Life and immortality to light by what means? Through the gospel, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice also 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 53 and 54. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 and 54. Very clearly, it's saying that immortality must be put on. If you have to put it on, it's because you don't have it by nature. It says there, the Apostle Paul speaking about the resurrection, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is what? Death is swallowed up in victory. If man is immortal by nature, why would Jesus have to die to give him what he already has? You see, immortality is one of the incommunicable attributes of God. Do you know what those attributes are? For example, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, immutability, and also immortality. You see, immortality is something that belongs only to God. So what were the two lies that the devil brought in in the Garden of Eden? Two lies that are being presented even within the Christian church today. First lie, you will not surely die. And the idea is that human beings have some type of immortal soul that lives on after death, that even God cannot eradicate or destroy because it is indestructible. They say, well, yeah, that's true, but you see, the wicked will suffer death by burning eternally in hell. Well, that's not death. Death means to be deprived of what? Life. It means simply death from which there is no resurrection. The Bible says they shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not awake, speaking about the wicked. And so the first lie is that man is by nature immortal. The devil said, you will not surely die. The second lie is also being taught in many Christian pulpits. And that is the idea that you can be like God knowing good and evil. That's the foundation of postmodern thought. It's the foundation of the emerging church idea, where people say, 
Don't tell me what the Bible says. Don't tell me what your ethical system is. I believe that I can decide on my own what is right and what is wrong. And that's why in the Christian church, you have people who say that it's okay to live a gay lifestyle, and you have people that say that it's not okay to live a gay lifestyle. And those who believe that you can live a gay lifestyle, they said, don't impose your ethics on me. This is what I believe to be true. Let me ask you, who is it that defines truth? Is it something that comes out of my heart? I know good and evil. I don't have to do what God says. Absolutely not. Good and evil are defined outside of man by God, in His holy law and in His holy word. And we must live like Jesus lived, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Only in that way can we be absolutely safe from the arguments of Satan. Let's not argue with him. Let's take the Bible the way that it is written. And let's simply obey God because God's way is always the best way. The devil wanted people to think that by getting rid of the law, you would be truly free. You would be emancipated and you would be able to choose your own ethical lifestyle. Let me ask you, has it worked out very well? Just look at the world. Wars and rumors of wars, corruption, thefts, kidnappings, murders. What is the world like without the law of God? The devil wants to get rid of the law. And any church or any theologian that says that the law was nailed to the cross, that we're under law, we're not under law, we're under grace, so God doesn't expect us to keep the law, is simply repeating the deceptions that Satan spoke in the Garden of Eden. You will not surely die, but you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the short of it, folks, is that our only hope of life is found outside of us in Jesus Christ, who came and died for our sins. And our only hope of knowing what is good and what is evil is also outside of us in God's holy law and in God's holy word. I pray to God that we will live the way that Jesus lived. Every time that the devil came to Jesus, Jesus didn't argue with him. Jesus didn't say, well, I think this or I think that. Jesus simply said, man shall not live by bread alone, but he shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Mm -hmm.